emergency legislation to preserve these two vital capabilities. First, the capability for telephone and internet companies in the UK to retain data on who contacted who, when and where. And second, the capability for such companies who offer services to UK customers to assist in specific UK national security or criminal investigations, regardless of where in the world these companies are based. When Snowden made his revelations, Edward Snowden, it was his desire to start a debate. That debate has now begun. It's interesting to see that the first time these provisions, now this mass surveillance that's been going on, is subjected to a genuine debate, it didn't stand up. It's a pause, it really is. Um, this is the first time in almost 14 years uh, that we've actually stopped uh, certain uh, provisions. And I mean, it is significant in that regard, beyond just the symbology of it that the, the, sort of the national security mindset was unable to prevail in this case. Uh, I think the Patriot Act, most of its provisions actually, should simply sunset, be rescinded altogether and not be renewed. But I think even the USA Freedom Act, which is better than the Patriot Act, still doesn't really reflect the full weight of the circuit court opinion that these provisions have been unconstitutional from their beginning and that what the government has been doing is illegal. We really have to look at the larger USA Freedom Act uh, much closer. Um, why? Because it effectively codifies all the secret interpretations, all a lot of the other authority they claimed were enabled by the previous legislation, including the Patriot Act. But what I think, believe is part of Obama's legacy is this legal framework of things that were considered stopgap, that were temporary, never considered to be actually permanent, even by the original like authors of the Patriot Act. This would essentially codify it, and that's the real concern. The mass surveillance of our citizens without probable cause to suspect a crime is simply wrong, should not be happening, and it should all end. Do we really need this sort of this vast expansion in, in surveillance powers, when in fact, we every time we find out, did it stop any of the critical terrorist incidents or the, of those that have been planned or actually occurred, did it actually stop them? No. To Snowden, I think it should first of all be recognized that he does have a right of asylum. Uh, in many, many, most countries in the world, uh, he cannot get a fair trial in the United States. In my own opinion, uh, he would be, I don't think he'll ever be able to get a fair trial unless our law is changed to make it really more in accordance with the Constitution. He's not able any more than I was able in my own case, and I was the first person to be prosecuted for revealing classified information. I was not able to answer the question in court, why did I copy the Pentagon Papers? Uh, he could do no more here. Motive is supposedly not an element. It's a, what they call a strict liability crime, simply did you do what you're accused of doing? No question of motive, whether it harmed anyone or not. As a restriction on freedom of speech, of truth-telling, that's really intolerable under a democracy.
So what's extraordinary about this law being passed in the UK is that it very closely mirrors the Protect America Act of 2007 that was passed in the United States at the request of the National Security Agency in any circumstance to pass an emergency law uh, when we're not in a time of total war. You know, we don't have bombs falling, we don't have U-boats in the harbor. Uh, and, yet, uh, and yet we're being told that if we don't give the government new authorities immediately um, without any debate, just taking their word for it, despite the fact that these exact same authorities were just declared unlawful by the European Court of Justice, uh, that we'll pay a price. Is it really going to be so costly for us to take a few days to debate where the lines should be drawn about these authorities and what really serves the public interest? If these surveillance authorities are so intrusive, so invasive, that courts are actually saying they violate fundamental rights, do we really want to authorize them on a new, increased, and more intrusive scale without any public debate at all? Ed Snowden. Ed is uh, in a remote location somewhere in Russia, uh, controlling this bot with, from his laptop. So he can see what the bot can see. Ed, welcome to the TED stage. What, what can you see, as a matter of fact? <laughs> I can see everyone. This is amazing. <laughs> um, Ed, um, some questions for you. You've been called many things in the last few months. You've been called uh, a whistleblower, uh, a traitor, a hero. What words would you describe yourself with? You know, we, everybody who's involved with this debate has been struggling over me and my personality and, and what, how to describe it. But when I think about it, these, these, this isn't the question that we should be struggling with. Who I am really doesn't matter at all. If I'm the worst person in the world, you can hate me and, and move on. What really matters here are the issues. What really matters here is the kind of government we want, the kind of internet we want, the kind of relationship between people and societies. And that's what I'm hoping the debate will move towards, and we've seen that increasing over time. If I had to describe myself, I wouldn't use words like hero, I wouldn't use patriot, and I wouldn't use traitor. I'd say I'm an American and I'm a citizen, just like everyone else. Hmm. So just to give some context for those who don't know the whole, whole story. This time, um, this time uh, a year ago, you were stationed in Hawaii working as a consultant to the NSA. You had, as a sysadmin, you had access to their systems. Um, and you began um, re revealing certain classified documents to some hand-picked journalists, um, leading the way to June's revelations. Now, what propelled you to do this? You know, when I was sitting in Hawaii, uh, and the years before when I was working in the intelligence community, I saw a lot of things that had disturbed me. We do a lot of good things in the intelligence community, things that need to be done and things that help everyone. But there are also things that go too far. There are things that shouldn't be done and decisions that were being made in secret without the public's awareness, without the public's consent, and without even our representatives in government having knowledge of these programs. When I really came to struggle with these issues, I thought to myself, how can I do this in the most responsible way that maximizes the public benefit while minimizing the risks? And out of all the solutions that I could come with, out of going to Congress when there was no laws, there were no legal protections for a, a private employee, a co contractor in intelligence like myself, there was, there was a risk that I would be buried along with the information and the public would never find out. But the First Amendment of the United States Constitution guarantees us a free press for a reason. And that's to enable an adversarial press to challenge the government but also to work together with the government to have a dialogue and debate about how we can inform the public about matters of vital importance without putting our national security at risk. And by working with journalists, by giving all of my information back to the American people, 
rather than trusting myself to make the decisions about publication. We've had a robust debate with a deep investment by the government that I think has resulted in a benefit for, for everyone. And the risks that have been, have been threatened, the risks that have been played up by the government have never materialized. We've never seen any evidence of even a single instance of specific harm. So let's, um, and let's show... And because of that, I'm comfortable with the decisions that I make. So let's, let me show um, the audience a couple of examples of, of uh, what you revealed. If you can have a slide up. And Ed, um, I don't know whether you can see, if you, the slides are here. This is a slide of the PRISM program. And um, maybe you could tell the audience what, what that was that was revealed. The best way to understand PRISM, because there's been a little bit of controversy, is to first talk about what PRISM is. Much of the debate in the U.S. has been about metadata. They've said it's just metadata, it's just metadata, and they're talking about a specific legal authority called Section 215 of the Patriot Act. That allows sort of a warrantless wiretapping, mass surveillance of the entire country's sort of phone records, things like that. Who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, uh, where you travel, these are all metadata events. PRISM is about content. It's a program through which the government could compel corporate America. It could sort of deputize corporate America to do its dirty work for the NSA. And even though some of these companies did resist, even though some of them, I believe Yahoo was one of them, challenged them in court, they all lost because it was never tried by an open court. They were only tried by a secret court. And something that we've seen, something about the PRISM program that's very concerning me is there's been a talking point in the U.S. government where they've said 15 federal judges have reviewed these programs and found them to be lawful. But what they don't tell you is those are secret judges in a secret court based on secret interpretations of law that's considered 34,000 warrant requests over 33 years and in 33 years only rejected 11 government requests. These aren't the people that we want deciding what the role of corporate America in a free and open internet should be. Now, this, this slide that we're showing here shows the dates in which different technology companies, internet companies, are um, alleged to have, have joined the program and where data collection began from them. Now, they have denied collaborate, collaborating with the NSA. How was that data collected by the NSA? Right, so the NSA's own slides refer to it as direct access. What that means to an actual NSA analyst, someone like me who is working as an intelligence analyst, uh, targeting you know, uh, Chinese cyber actors, things like that, Hawaii, is the provenance of that data is directly from their servers. It doesn't mean that there's a you know, group of company representatives sitting in a smoky room with the NSA palling around and making backroom deals about how they're going to give this stuff away. Now, each company handles it different ways. Some are responsible, some are somewhat less responsible. But the bottom line is when we talk about how this information is, is given, uh, it's coming from the companies themselves. It's not stolen from the lines. But there's an important thing to remember here. Even though companies push back, even though companies uh, demanded, hey, let's do this through a warrant process. Let's do this, you know, where we actually have some sort of legal review, some sort of basis for handing over these users' data. We saw stories in the Washington Post last year that weren't as well reported as the PRISM story that said the NSA broke in to the data center communications between Google to itself and Yahoo to itself. So even these companies that are cooperating in at least a compelled but hopefully lawful manner with the NSA, the NSA isn't satisfied with that. Think of me